guys, and welcome back to episode 40 of The Carla Garrick Show. Today we will be doing part two of the two-part series in which I talk about how I beat alcohol. I hope you'll take a look and please feel free to reach out if you have any questions, if you're struggling with the same issue, if you just want someone to hold your hand or you just want someone to listen. You can always reach me at Carla at CarlaGarrick.com. That's Carla, C-A-R-L-A, Garrick, G-E-R-I-C-K-E. And I'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, please enjoy this second part of my sit down discussion with Tom Woods on how I beat alcohol. Thanks, guys. Now, in recent years, when you hear people talk about drug or alcohol addiction, a lot of times, now this is leading up to a, a very personal question that you can absolutely punt on. I have no right to know the answer. And, and you don't even have to give any details. But I'm not even sure this applies to you, which is that the re, that if we're going to succeed in helping people kick addiction, we have to get to the heart of why they have the addiction. And the, the common diagnosis today is there's some trauma in the person's life that they're running away from, and that that's, that's what's going on, and that once we address that trauma, we can address the addiction. But I, I'm sure that is true in the case of many people, but I also think some people get drawn to it because it's fun. You know, like I think Occam's razor sometimes is necessary rather than go into all this therapeutic mumbo jumbo. Sometimes people just like it because it's fun. So how do you feel like, which one of those do you think describes you better? Um, why not both, as we like to say oh, on the okay. internet. Um, so, I mean, I don't think my upbringing was traumatic in any true sense. I mean, I know my parents truly loved me, but, you know, I was 10 years old and I got put in some crappy little boarding school and they flew off to Sweden and I was 10 years old. You know, that's a little kid. Uh, you know, I look at my nieces and nephews now and I'm kind of like, wow, you know, I was a little kid and my parents lived in an entirely different continent. And we're talking about the eighties, right? You didn't have the internet. You couldn't zoom with them. You didn't yeah. have chats. You'd be on a phone for maybe like four minutes on a Sunday kind of thing. So I definitely think some of that had some influence on it. But also, yeah, alcohol is fun. It's a lot of people I know can use it in moderation or don't get addicted. Um, kudos to them. I think that's that's really good. Um, one of the things that actually happened with me too, and this sounds almost trite, but I was on Pinterest and this little, it was a Lao Tzu um, quote, and he's not the same as Sun Tao, the, the, the other guy, uh, Lao Tzu, he's the um, father of Taoism. And it was, it was just a little meme and it really struck me. And it basically said, if you're depressed, you're living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future. And if you're at peace, you're living in the now. Oh, that's that, good. Right? Yeah. And I read that and I was like, oh, I want to be at peace in the now. Like I want to be fully conscious in the now, right? Like we have this one life to live. And so I want to use my time purposefully and optimally. And I was like, I'm not living in the now because I'm constantly thinking either that I'm anxious about something that's going to happen because I'm imbibing a neurotoxin or I'm literally just thinking, where am I gonna get my next drink from, right? And whether that's the physical addiction or the mental addiction, the reality is I was expending a lot of time thinking about booze and like excuses to get it in some way. And of course that's addictive behavior. And so I've really mindfully tried to introduce things into my life to fully be able to appreciate living in the now. I don't want to be depressed and I don't want to be anxious. I want to be at peace. I have a guy who's listened to every single, actually there, you'd be surprised how many strange people have listened to. No, I love them. I love people who've listened to all my episodes. That's absolutely amazing to me. That's amazing. But I, I have one guy who says, I love every single episode you've done except one. And that one is episode number 342. Now, I, I don't know them all by heart, Carla. I looked this one up while we were on here just now. But this is the one I did with a guy, Dr. Lance Dotus. And he's I, he may be from Harvard. He's from some prestigious school. And he wrote a book in which he expressed skepticism 
about the merits of 12-step programs. Now, like you, I'm not saying we ban 12-step programs or, you know, or neither is he, but he, he claims that their success rate is actually not that high, but the people who are successful with it go around and proselytize about it. And this particular guy is one of those. He says, Alcoholics Anonymous absolutely saved my life. And so great for him. But it was interesting to me to hear a professional say, I'm not really convinced that it does a whole lot of good. And it sounds to me, unless you left this out of your post, that you haven't used it. And it's an ongoing thing. Like Even if you haven't had a drink for 20 years, you still go to AA meetings. Somehow you're not doing that. Can you say something about that? Yeah. So, you know, I I looked into AA maybe like 15 years ago is definitely before I moved to New Hampshire. And and honestly, I have a friend, uh, Joanne uh, from New York City, and we we go way back to San Francisco. We worked together back in the dot com days and she and I would get fat and skinny together over the years. So we would go to Weight Watchers meetings. And, you know, one of the things you do at Weight Watchers is you kind of have to stand up and you kind of do the, you know, well, I was good because I met these points or, you know, I didn't succeed and whatever. And I remember so clearly actually getting up and then just sitting down and I looked over at her and I said, I think I'm at the wrong meeting. (laughs) Because I was like, my problem isn't with eating. My problem was consuming a lot of empty calories on top of, you know, a a not healthy diet at the time. But it wasn't like I've never been gluttonous or someone who overeats or anything, but definitely over drinking. So I remember going online, looking at the AA stuff and then just being like, no, I don't think this is for me for several reasons. One is I don't count the days. I happen to know that I quit on Boxing Day in 2017, and I sort of filed that away. But beyond that, I don't look at how long it's been or anything. I also am like, it's just, it's out of my life. It's it's a non-issue. It's, um, I, I mean, I'm interested in helping other people who want to choose this course for themselves to help them choose it. And I think the important part is putting yourself front and center in this and understanding that these are individualistic decisions that have to come from you, right? Again, aligning your thoughts and your actions, which is an internal process. And so what I don't like about AA was the sort of that there are these steps that you have to constantly go back, that it's a disease that you can never get away from. There is a lot of debate now, right? Whether it's just, is it just a bad habit, which frankly, I think it really just is a bad habit, right? How are you spending your time? If you're spending the majority of your time drinking, that's a bad habit. Can you replace the bad habit? Can you replace the amount of time with something that is productive and good for you? Yes, yes, you can, right? So you replace a bad habit with a good habit. Um, And then I didn't like with AA as well, that sort of notion of you gotta keep going back, that you're a disease, that you know you can't. It, it, I think it was that whole. They have that component, whether it's religious or not, where you're sort of like, you you're you're hapless to this other being. I think I'm using the wrong words, but that's the notion, right? You you um, you give yourself over to a higher power, which you know I'm fine with. But I also think it has to come internally with your relationship with your own consciousness. And I believe sobriety, at least for me. Um, And I specifically always say alcohol free because some people are like sobriety means you don't use other substances. And I certainly therapeutically use other things. I think there's a lot of um, good drugs out there that can help people in different ways, but none of that's ever been an issue for me. It's not an ongoing thing. It's a therapeutic health, you know, tap in, tap out thing. Um, So for me, I think I felt very strongly it has to come from internally and it has to be, I'm striving for higher consciousness and the healthier I feel. And I think approaching it from a health perspective, as opposed to it's alcohol or it's whatever, it's like, how do we at our age and going forward, optimize our lives so that we're healthy And what does healthy mean? It means to me, at least, that I have control over my mind and my body and that I'm striving to become like 
I don't know, a better person. It sounds trite, but, but really like, how can I be the best me and how can I help you? Or, well, you're already a pretty good you, but you know, other people who are maybe struggling to be like, hey, let's figure it out. You figure it out, put yourself in the center of this story because each one of us is the hero of our own story. And I think it can be really empowering from a, you know, from a libertarian perspective to help people really gain some sense of ownership over their lives, which then, you know, you when you learn to trust yourself with one thing, that opens up the next step to try this next thing. And can I trust myself with this? I mean, someone like me again, who was pretty shy. I mean, I'm doing TV shows now. I'm stone cold sober and I'm talking to you. You know, like you can do it. You just have to do the, now I sound like, hey, I was gonna say, just do the steps, but do the work, I guess. Yeah. Now, again, I'm not going to tell people what they should do if they're having a problem with alcohol, that there's only one approach or that this approach they shouldn't do. I've never been in that situation. I'm not going to make a judgment on that. And different things seem to work for different people. Uh, maybe people have different levels of severity with the problem. Okay, fair enough. But I will say that, that what I have found off-putting about the 12-step programs is the very strong implication that if it doesn't work for you, then you haven't worked the program. You weren't mm. really working the program. So it's a circular argument. Um, and then secondly, there there's at least, I don't know if it's in the big book or it's what's read at the meetings, but I know there's at least one passage where they go on and on about people who don't succeed with the program. These are people who just aren't serious and can never get their act together. And there's no program could ever possibly help. I mean, all right already okay you know it's one thing to say we have a great program here and it works for a lot of people but it's quite another to go into this long tirade about people who have other experiences um the other thing i want to ask you is are you ever tempted at all and 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 even if you're in an environment full of people drinking so uh, generally, no, although I will say, you know, we were uh, up at Barter Farm at our friends uh, for Christmas, and one of my friends actually sat down next to me and he had poured a really nice uh, scotch. And when he put the glass down, I smelt it. And, I, and it, was, it was definitely sort of a muscle memory mm, little moment, right? Because we, we are so, you know, uh, our senses are such a part of us. And I, I, it, it was a moment, I smelt it, I thought about booze for a hot second. And then I was just like, eh. And I got up, I went and did something else at the kitchen. And when I came back, I, I couldn't smell it. I didn't notice it. So there'll be those little moments. Um, I did avoid certain social situations that I just maybe don't go to anymore. I just, uh, it, it just doesn't serve me. Um, or I'll go for the first two hours so I don't have to close down every single party anymore. Someone else could do that work for me. Um, but yeah, back to the AA stuff, just kind of telling people they're going to fail if they don't do it their way. There are so many approaches to changing uh, your relationship with alcohol. And it really just depends on what, you know, some people just want to drink less. That didn't work for me. I just couldn't maintain that. And I didn't like the energy I was expending trying to stick to that. Mm -hmm. There are drugs now, you know, there's naltrexone, which is a drug. It's a non-patentable drug. So you won't hear about it, but you know, you can order it from India or probably get a doctor to prescribe it if you want. And it is a pill that will literally take away your urge to drink after two drinks. People use it in Hollywood. It is actually like a very quiet little secret that there are all these people who, who want to be able to drink but who can't contain themselves now use that drug. So something like that is available. I actually considered it, in fact, ordered some. I still have all of them here. I don't know if it was the crutch I needed so that I was like, I have a fallback. If this doesn't work out, you could try this that maybe having it empowered me more to just be like, no, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm going with. But you know, there, there's, there's a lot of resources. There were a lot of good books I read. So maybe for folks who, who are kind of looking for some answers, there was a very, very good book that I recommend, This Naked Mind. The author is Annie Grace. 
And she, um, she actually approached it from both, you know, it's her personal story about drinking, but she's a scientist. And so it's very science-based. So I think for our kind of people, it, I found it very compelling, right? Because I was like, oh, wait a second. Yeah, no one ever told me, I mean, my body told me it was a poison, but it's not like television or anyone, you know, all we see is the binge drinking and everyone's having a great time. They never show the day after the binge drinking, the real hangovers or the real consequences. You know, there's a lot of disconnect between what we're showing in pop culture and what the reality is. Um, so I found that book really, really uh, compelling for me to to help understand that there is a neurological aspect in the sense that, you know, you're you're rotting your brain. <laughs> it's yeah. not good for you. It, it literally is a neurotoxin. And then the other thing she talks about in the book that I think we lose sight of a lot is that it's a depressant. So one of the reasons also I started looking uh, at this and at my life was I was like, ah, I think I'm depressed and I have no reason to be. My life is amazing. And then I realized, oh, but you're kind of self-medicating for anxiety with the actual product that is causing the anxiety. So talk about like a really dysfunctional feedback loop, right? You're using medicine that is causing the outcome. And so that book really helped me see that. There were a couple of others. There's uh, Rachel Hollis. Um, I didn't know this, but she's a I guess she's like a hipster Christian writer. I found her through a different way, but I was looking up the name earlier. And her book was Girl, Wash Your Face. I think that would probably appeal more to, to the ladies. Uh, but on the, the dude side, there's the Mark Mason book. And that's the one about the subtle art of not giving a F, you know, and, and, and just sort of that sort of sense of self-empowerment. Um, Ellen Carr, who's like an old school guy who's written every book about how to quit smoking and vaping. He had some on alcohol. It's the same tricks um, there. And then actually another book that didn't actually relate to alcohol, but that really was quite um, influential on me. Uh, it's this lady, her name's Susan Pierce Thompson. And she talks about bright line eating. And she does a whole program, and I think she's helped thousands, if not tens of thousands of people with their diets and sort of uh, lifestyle choices. But what I liked about her and what's in the title, The Bright Line Eating, is she was just like, look, there are some things like you just got to draw the line. So I had to, for me, draw the line with alcohol. It wasn't working to try less, do more, any of that. So I just wanted to draw a line. And even, you know, I do low carb. Um, but for years, I mean, I did it for five years where I never lost weight and then I got serious and then I actually made the changes I needed to make. And that was when I stopped going, well, I can cheat on the weekend or uh, today. No, it was just like, no, these are the choices I'm making to inform my life, to actually give me the life I want to live and I want to lead. And I have the control over it. And I think it's so empowering. I mean, it was empowering for me, but it can be equally empowering for every other person listening to this. Like if you want to make a choice in your life, it's up to you. Well, that is just the message people need to hear. I, I jotted down all the books you mentioned. So I'm going to list them and link to them at tomwoods.com slash 2261, where I'm also going to link to that blog post of yours. Um, but what is, in general, for people who don't go to that page, what's your what's your blog, uh, like what's the URL so people can go there? It's uh, it's literally my name. So it's carlagarrick.com. And, you know, and I blog about a lot of things, but I think I'm going to lean a little bit more into the lifestyle stuff. I feel like that's maybe an area of libertarianism and self-empowerment and all these sort of words that other spaces get to use. But when you really break it down, that's our space. It's yeah. about people. It's about the individual. And it's about how do you craft the best life for you. And so I was like, you know, yeah, we've got Austrian economics and we got all the other stuff, but ultimately it starts with each of us. And if we're not actually champions for the philosophy by going, hey, it starts first with you. I actually think the only social contract we have in society is to not be a burden on society. So, hey, Karen, 
before you are like, oh, I gotta go fix this, or you gotta do this, or this and this. It's like that meme where it's the fat lady with the mask and the uh, the per and she's saying, wear a mask uh, for my health. And it's like, no, let's each start with ourselves, with our personal units, and let's try the best with that unit before we look at you or you or you. Let's start with ourselves. And I think if we do that and we get that to catch on, society is going to start to heal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I want to make sure everybody knows how to spell your last name. So if they want to go to your website, so Carla, C-A-R-L-A, -A, so Carla with a C, and then Garrick, G-E-R-I-C-K-E, -E, so CarlaGarrick.com. I will say that it's not entirely by coincidence that this is the first episode of 2023, because even though we all know that the change to a new year doesn't strictly mean anything, it is nevertheless an opportune moment for us to stop and reflect on ourselves. And, and it, it can be a very healthy moment to do so. And I think, Carla, your story can be helpful as people start a new year and maybe gives them ambitions to uh, to, to make changes or even forces them in a gentle way to acknowledge in their own minds that a change is needed. So I really, really appreciate your candor, your willingness to be so open with us about this. It's just tremendous. And and congratulations to you on, on this great milestone. And it's not exactly on the dot, five years to the dot, because that just goes to show you're not keeping track of the days. But honestly, congratulations to you. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for asking me to do this show. I actually think it's a really important topic and I think it can really help our community grow and become exceptional. And thank you very much for watching, ladies and gentlemen.